Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for today's webinar. Um, we are waiting for a couple more people to join, but I want to let you know the team is here and ready, and we'll start up in a couple of minutes. Thanks. All right, thanks everybody for joining us for today's webinar that looks at our cloud predictions for 2021 and how we expect it will bring more demand, partnerships, and industry innovation to the overall cloud space. I'm Alan Kranz. I head up our cloud and software research practice. I'm joined by the entire team today, Katie Merrill, Nicole Catchpole, and Evan Wolcott. Um, and we'll each be taking a, a section that analyzes some of the themes and um, things that we expect to see develop and be important as we move into 2021. Before we dive right into the content, I just have a couple housekeeping notes. Um, at the bottom of your screens, there's a series of buttons from left to right. You can access the slides, uh, the audio controls, submit a Q&A and see other questions that have been asked. Uh, you can see our bios, uh, and you'll also be able to, to take our survey. Um, so we appreciate you taking the time to, to do that so we can make these uh, most valuable for you going forward. If you have any questions, uh, you can submit them via that widget. Uh, you can also reach out afterwards to any of the analysts presenting. Um, our email addresses are included. Uh, and there's also an email address that's just webinars at tbri.com. Uh, so feel free to, to reach out at any point with uh, questions during the session or, or certainly afterwards. So without further ado, uh, we'll get into kind of the introduction and the setup for what we think is going to develop in terms of the cloud space in, in 2021. So when we look at what's happened over the past year in, in 2020, um, you know, I think it's an understatement to say that cloud has been resilient in the face of the economic disruption and the overall effects of the pandemic. Um, and I say that because when, when we look at the core value props of cloud solutions that have really been pretty consistent throughout its uh, decade plus uh, series of adoption throughout the market, um, in a lot of ways, the effects have amplified and brought those even more to the forefront for a lot of customers. So first of all, flexibility. So that can be, as we know, both scaling down as well as scaling up the resources that are available through cloud solutions um, with a lot of the, the headcount reductions, uh, the financial impacts in a lot of these industries. There's been an immediate need to to reduce expense and to um, to react to the changing organization, um, both in terms of reduction um, as well as scaling up portions of the business that and, and the technology that supports them that helps them survive and um, adapt their business model to the conditions out, out in the market. So that flexibility has really been highlighted and taken advantage of by more organizations as they reacted um, in the immediate uh, after effects of the pandemic, but 
for a lot of industries, it's persisted. Um, solutions are going to stay in place long term and evolve as the the market does. The distributed work, so a lot of the workforce being shifted to a remote model. Um, again, having the ability leveraging cloud solutions to be able to to get them up and running, be productive, um, access the services and applications that the uh, the workforce needs to continue business is um, again highlighted and drove a lot of demand for uh, virtual desktop VDI solutions that a lot of times are supported by cloud given the, the necessity to, to make that shift very rapidly um, in industries where remote work and work from home was not a big part of their organization previously. Um, a lot of those shifts have been very dramatic and, and swift in terms of being implemented. Um, another area that's been highlighted is the skills and expertise that are available uh, through cloud solutions where uh, you don't have to worry about the hands-on management of physical data center assets. Um, that's been a big benefit, again, due to um, uh, health issues, social distancing requirements, um, and, you know, that really hit a space where skills were already in short demand. Um, and so being able to, to um, capitalize on the, the base that vendors have built up either through automation or through their own uh, staffing resources has been a big advantage of that's highlighted the some of the risks that the traditional data center delivery, those workloads rely on a model that became much more difficult. Um, and so being able to, to leverage cloud as a source of skills and resources um, is something that, that drove the demand and uh, was an advantage. The last, the last area, and it kind of gets into this certain uncertainty that we expect in 2021, is the continuous streams of innovation. Th this wasn't always um, at the forefront of customers' minds in terms of cloud. Uh, typically, there's a lot more kind of cost savings, shift to OpEx value propositions that um, get folks started in their evaluations. Um, but the innovation that they're able to leverage from uh, cloud infrastructure, cloud software as a service providers, again, was highlighted due to the, um, not just the, the existing pandemic, but looking forward, and, and I've heard from a lot more customers, they want to be more ready than they were going forward for uncertain events. Um, and that can take multiple different forms. It doesn't need to be another uh, worldwide pandemic, but localized events, natural disasters, all of those things, changes in uh, the society and economic activity, all those really kind of exposed a big um, area of exposure for risk, um, given that uncertainty. And so being able to be tied into a platform where there's not only the vendor that's continually innovating and um, rolling out services, we saw it with COVID um, from multiple different cloud providers, things that help them directly uh, address some of the challenges that's tied into a consistent platform that can be rolled out without um, spooling up additional data center resources um, and everything that's involved with doing a, a project start to finish in a traditional data center. Um, those are all things, again, that were highlighted and that customers want to be able to leverage those going forward more than the, more than they have. And so for all those reasons, that's what drove a lot of the um, increased adoption that we saw in terms of revenue, but also the change in culture and the perception of value. Um, it's tougher to measure that, but, it, you know, we saw it in the customer conversations. Um, we heard it in speaking with a lot of the, the cloud vendors throughout the year that um, they're working with customers to reduce expense today, help them survive the, um, the onset of COVID in 2020. Um, but as they build those relationships, we, we think it'll only accelerate the, the rate of cloud adoption in 2021. 
um, in, in, in future years due to all of the value propositions of cloud that have been highlighted um, throughout the course of the, the prior year. And so a lot of the that realization of that pent-up demand um, and increased value perception of cloud is going to depend on when the, the current pandemic subsides, things start to get back to normal, um, and especially in a lot of industries when their uh, demand cycles start to, to, to come back um, and they're able financially to, to do to realize some of these transformation dreams that are um, going to be supported with with cloud delivered resources and in, uh, in cloud environments. So for the current year, um, you know, I think that we pulled people. This was in October. Um, so there's been obviously been some developments with vaccine rollout um, and other things throughout the the past couple of months that that may have changed this a bit. Um, but I don't think you would see a significant change. I think, um, you know, I, like most of the folks that I know who aren't in healthcare, um, are still uncertain when uh, vaccines would be available, um, and also what that means from a behavior standpoint um, in terms of travel and resumption of in-person work. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns that, um, again, another, as I talk about it, Another thing that highlights some of the value of cloud when you don't know exactly how much, when, um, or, or how things are going to uh, be needed from an IT resource standpoint, um, the, the benefits of cloud is you can pick it up and grow it when you need it, um, but it's not going to be an asset that just sits unused in, until that time. And so I think when we look at the perception from these folks, um, these are IT decision makers that um, have implemented cloud within their organizations. And, you know, I think the general consensus is we're not going to know exactly when um, the effects of COVID are going to subside, um, but it's probably going to be sometime towards the end of 2021. Um, and, you know, there's just a handful of skeptics that think that it'll persist into the, the next year. But I think in general, um, most folks, as you can see, you know, by by fall and um, heading towards the end of the year, uh, expect that um, the vaccines will be doing their part to, to help um, folks avoid uh, contracting the disease and get back to a more normal business environment. Um, and so we'd expect to, to see more kind of large cloud deals, more large IT transformations start um, planning mid-year and you know, roll out later in 2021 and, and into the, the next year. Um, so that's kind of the overall context in terms of the, the environment, what we've seen, and, um, you know, when we think some of that pent-up demand um, will start to play out in terms of actual revenue numbers. Um, I will hand it over to Nikki in just a second um, to cover the, the next three trends, uh, two of which kind of center on partnerships and the role of industry for uh, playing a more important part for how cloud is going to be brought to market and the uh, the customization based on, on industry. Um, and then Katie will close with a look at containers, which is really a common theme for a lot of the bigger uh, organizations implementing multi-cloud environments and uh, doing customization and, and developing solutions that uh, can, can cross multiple different clouds and, and on-prem models um, and containers being the vehicle that uh, that they're looking to, to do that with. All right. Thank you, ahead. Alan. Yeah. Yes, great. Thanks, Alan. Um, so the prediction topic that I'll be focusing on today centers around partnerships, which um, you know, it really goes without saying is incredibly broad and is at this point embedded in some way in almost every organization's operating model. Uh, specifically, though, I'll be pulling out some themes that TBR has recognized as not only emerging within the last year, but what we believe will become central for both short and long-term cloud adoption and overall digital transformation. And so, I mean, this is a predictions webinar, and today isn't about looking back, 
but I do think it's important to recognize how far we have come when thinking about partnerships. And it really wasn't all that long ago that we were just shedding ourselves of, um, you know, the buzzwords of, you know, quote unquote, competition. And really that ecosystems and complex partnership networks were only just starting to take hold. And this was right before the pandemic. And also just to add to that, um, partnerships traditionally were relationships that didn't come together overnight and not something to race into. But as we all know, cue the early spring of 2020 and many of the carefully thought out timelines um, related to cloud migration amongst many other things and all those nice three to five year plans were pretty much blown out of the water. So back in March when everyone was figuring out what was going on and you know, let alone how to react, partnerships became a core component that mitigated some very serious and immediate challenges. And many of these were forming around the need to extract data and actionable insights from the vast amount of information suddenly clogging systems, especially in healthcare. So what this brings me to is the first aspect of my prediction regarding partnerships, which is that the pandemic-driven acceleration of cloud adoption caused the rapid formation of many key partnerships to solve both short-term issues while also paving the way for much longer-term collaboration. And now a second layer to this prediction is that I believe vendors will no longer be as hesitant to reach out, form partnerships, even in times outside of crisis, as, as Alan had alluded to, and that you know, people would be overall more open to try new relationships than they had before. Um, there are a couple of key examples that um, I will speak to. Um, they're, they're related to healthcare. That's really kind of the anchoring point that shows how important these partnerships were, how quickly they were formed, and some of the long-term effects that they will have even after the pandemic is over. Um, AWS is one of the vendors who answered this call to action by coming together with um, the Mayo Clinic and ZocDoc. Um, this is a collaboration that harnessed um, collective industry expertise and parsed together out relevant information and data sets with machine learning models, which turned into the AWS COVID-19 data lake. What this does now is function as a centralized repository of vetted and current data sets that's being constantly refined and continues to improve clinical outcomes. And as of now, is not just related to COVID, but has started to extend into other areas of disease population management. Um, Google Cloud is another leading vendor. Um, Google Cloud, uh, together with Harvard, um, created the Google Harvard COVID-19 public forecast. Um, so this was developed on Google Cloud's infrastructure with guidance from the Harvard Global Health Institute to help project COVID-19 cases, deaths, and other metrics. And it also allows for targeted testing and public health interventions on a country-by-country -country basis. So while this was used within the construct of COVID relief and planning, the work done here, as with AWS, also incorporates technologies such as machine learning and AI guided by input with these leading scientists. Um, and all of this collaboration is not going to go away after the crisis is done. The work that is being established in response to COVID is paving the way for much longer term collaboration and, and benefits long after the, um, the crisis is over. Now, moving on, uh, I may be slightly biased when it comes to the topic of niche vendors. Um, augmenting vendor portfolios, given that I do focus on edge computing quite extensively, but I do find that this technology, um, how it's evolving and becoming integrated into portfolios to be really helpful in understanding how these interactions and partnerships can play out. So the second leg of my predictions is that these kinds of partnerships between smaller, more focused and nimble players will become increasingly vital to the portfolio expansion of leading vendors particularly when it comes to the integration of these quote unquote emerging technologies like edge into cloud portfolios. And in turn, edge, ven edge vendors are given an entryway into engagements at scale that they may not have had otherwise. Um, one example that I have that really illustrates this trend is the partnership between IBM and ClearBlade, which was recently formalized back in the fall. In this case, uh, ClearBlade Edge Asset Monitor functions as the application that extracts and processes data from any given device in the field. It's the actual thing that gets the data from whatever the device is. And you know, this could be anything from a railway crossing or a mall video camera, it, it doesn't matter. ClearBlade processes the data and displays it to the end user 
at either the edge or the cloud. And then IBM Edge Application Manager in turn manages the deployment of that application. They focus on the injection of machine data and ensure that the secure deployment to all edge gateways and devices happens securely and, and it's particularly relevant in remote uh, industrial and rugged environments. And then you know what IBM sees as a value add from ClearBlade in addition to the benefits of its infrastructure agnostic approach is that ClearBlade brings their kind of heritage of classic OT and IoT. And in the edge computing world where the majority of focus is on cloud native workloads, there is not a whole lot of classical OT or IoT expertise. And this ClearBlade expertise here is really a strong complement, especially in those more rugged industries. Um, so this is just one example in one particular area of technology that exemplifies you know, the TBR's prediction well, that this will become more of a central partnership theme in 2021 and beyond. The relationship between niche vendors, larger players, um, augmenting portfolio gaps, and seeing how those relationships play out um, as technology continues to evolve and cloud adoption continues to increase. Now the topic of ongoing portfolio aug augmentation, it merges nicely with the next prediction that we will start to see a lot more partnerships and innovation occur within the context of these open collaboration models or what many people are calling ecosystems. Um, so it's no longer just a matter of joint solutioning, but rather large scale and long-term innovation bring together communities of people across all these different roles. Um, to bring back to relate to the edge example that I just went through is um, another one related to IBM with their Open Horizon, which is an ecosystem of partners created for vendors and thought leaders to collaborate purely in a community trusted environment. Um, the open source development is a core component here so that as these pr projects gain traction, um, they'll better, they are created to better fit user needs and since open source makes it part of the entire development process. So there's a lot of intercollaboration within the context of the ecosystem. Um, another similar example is a partnership um, between Atos and Spain um, with the Pledger project. And what this aims to do is lay the foundation for edge computing infrastructures to facilitate development and implementation of new edge technologies while increasing overall edge accessibility. And there are a whole host of other ecosystem plays out there. And you know, the, the main takeaway here is that the various forms of ecosystems are popping up all over the place and are becoming more anchored as the norm, particularly when it comes to deployment of industry specific solutions, which is a really nice segue into um, what my colleague Evan will be delving into in more depth. So um, Evan, I will pass the mic over to you as I change the slides. Thank you, Nikki, and hello to everybody on the call today. Uh, the trend, uh, one trend we kind of decided to focus on this quarter is, is industry cloud and for some of you on the on this call today, you might be thinking, huh, it doesn't seem that new. Uh, dating back to about 2014, SAP kind of spearheaded this movement um, and, you know, started targeting more of that industry-based uh, approach to how they were going to go uh, about their cloud uh, go-to-market. I think, though, what happened, you know, six six years ago, seven years ago now, client maturity around cloud was, you know, not, nowhere near the levels it is today. Clients were mainly focusing on sort of those front end elements of their IT infrastructure, you know, uh, digitizing the CRM and other uh, assets which kind of support the sales and marketing divisions. And so they didn't really have the need, so to speak, for more of these, you know, refined, you know, targeted solutions that address very specific outcomes. Um, according to some of the latest research, though, you know, Clients have really matured in terms of what they're actually now consuming from a, at the cloud level. You know, ERP is now making it much more of a shift into the cloud. Uh, obviously, it's a much more complex uh, part of your infrastructure to shift over. Uh, obviously, SAP is kind of trying to drive that with their S4, S4 HANA movements. Um, but simply, you know, wanting to pursue more of these, uh, I guess you could say, targeted shifts into the cloud you can't do that in the same horizontal approach that was made possible in the front end. 
And what I mean by that is as you begin, as organizations begin to explore more specific use cases and outcomes with their cloud environments, they're targeted against very specific user needs, you know, pain points and expected outcomes. Um, we, I had a conversation with an IT executive working in the healthcare industry, and he was, you know, kind of speaking about how he was looking at the Salesforce Health Cloud and while it cost a premium, he was able to rationalize it to himself because it came with that pre-built data model, which really kind of eliminated a lot of the security concerns he had, while then allowing him to tie into some of the healthcare ecosystem, you know, be it an EHR provider or whatever, uh, you know, other entities are kind of feeding his data pipe that lets him do more with what he has. And so as these clients' needs begin to become more, you know, as they're, uh, we'll say their deployments are more mature and they're looking for these, you've seen the vendors uh, from the cloud, uh, cloud platform vendors begin to launch more uh, specific targeted uh, solutions. You know, Microsoft and Salesforce both launched health clouds during 2020. Uh, Salesforce, in response to COVID-19, also kind of sought to increase its presence in the public sector, and they tied up. Uh, with AWS to launch the uh, AW, uh, Salesforce on AWS GovCloud, which was really, you know, addressing some of the challenges that at the un in unemployment um, uh, systems becoming overloaded as, you know, as COVID kind of riffled through the economy. And so what we're expecting to see now is simply having the solutions won't be enough for cloud vendors to kind of make their, uh, make these industry clouds resonate with their clients. And so at the cloud platform level, we've seen, you know, Microsoft and both Salesforce targeting a lot of these IT services executives from firms like Accenture to kind of build out their own consulting and SI chops in order to bring the portfolio to the client, talk to them about what exactly they're trying to do, and then, uh, you know, feed those insights into the product development uh, so that they, you know, they're not just developing technology in a vacuum, but they're actually targeting it against very specific needs of the client. But, you know, while that's, you know, one approach, the, the cloud players simply just don't have the resource scale to kind of uh, take that, to, to do this on their own, so to speak. And so we've seen a kind of an uptick as a result in partnerships between the IT services folks who have domain knowledge across all the industries that are relevant and how they can kind of work with the cloud platforms to bring their IT deeper into these industries. It's interesting though at the IT services side of the house because <laughs> throughout 2020 we saw numerous acquisitions of you know, Salesforce partners, Microsoft partners, AWS partners because they're vying for some of that cloud migration implementation opportunity. But as they all kind of converge on this opportunity, they need to differentiate and increase their value to those cloud platforms so that they want to work more closely with them. You know, WePro simply deploying a 10,000 strong business unit against AWS won't be enough to make AWS want to work closer to them. They need to be able to align the domain needs um, that the vendors have against their strength in, you know, the various industries. And it's not just domain, it's also the fact that you need to have geographic coverage because oftentimes you're working hand in hand with these folks. Which brings you to another element of kind of that more consulting led sales uh, engagement, which is kind of being spearheaded in the innovation centers that we're seeing. Uh, CBR launched an innovation centers report in 2020, kind of focusing just on that. And the, you know, the key success criteria we kind of found in those centers is that when a IT service provider brings together all the relevant partners required to enable, you know, a use case into the conversation with the client and the clients, uh, all the essential shareholders within that, you know, enterprise. So they, it's not just about talking to IT, you need to talk to the line of business leaders and the people who are going to be hands-on with this technology. Otherwise, they run the risk of, you know, bringing a client into an innovation center and just throwing marketing pitches at them. You need, they need to be able to show them the actual outcomes they're going to serve and who they're going to be working with to enable that. Which then kind of brings up this entire notion of what ecosystem requirements are going to, need, how they're going to need to evolve in order to support these outcomes. As you look at, you know, healthcare, for instance, uh, you know, you have the EHRs, you have highly regulated data requirements thanks to HIPAA and all these other elements. That's just healthcare. Now you look at industrial manufacturing, if you're going into a factory floor, you have 3,000 
pieces of equipment operating in the in, in that factory, and that all of those pieces of equipment are transmitting data, oftentimes in different structures, you know, it's sometimes unstructured, it's thousands of lines of code per second, and it can easily overload a system. If you don't have the technology value chain, uh, you know, to, to kind of give a client, you know, the relevant data and be able to, you know, put your analytics on top of all of that so that it actually serves an outcome to the client, you're going to fall short in the market. SAP is a good example here. We're just looking at the business logistics work they've done. Um, I think in 3Q, they signed on a bunch of satellite partnerships, or partners, I'm sorry, because they wanted to be able to provide, you know, tracking of the actual ships and the cargo. So you can feed that data throughout your supply chain, improve your inventory management, so on and so forth. And so moving forward, kind of what we're expecting to see um, in industry cloud is more of that, you know, ecosystem evolution based off the industry and uh, without kind of establishing the, a succinct, you know, we'll call it a go-to-market around each of the industries, you're just going to, you're going to run the risk of kind of trying to take that similar, you know, horizontal one-size-fits-all approach just to a very complex market, which will kind of prolong the ability of these clients to be able to really consume more of your solutions to address more of their outcomes and, you know, uh, really drive your pool the proliferation of your IP across their environment. Uh, and with that, I'll turn the conversation over to Katie to speak on containers. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, so our final prediction that we're gonna to touch on today as we talk about bringing more demand to the cloud um, in 2021 is around containers and Kubernetes and how that adoption is really accelerating in the cloud era, but more specifically the hybrid and the multi-cloud area, and how COVID is actually going to drive that trend going forward. So what we've been tracking through 2020 and will continue to monitor through 2021 is how vendors are becoming more innovative in containers in tandem with their hybrid cloud strategies. In, in our own customer studies, we continue to hear that, you know, customers recognize the, the scalability and, and the efficiency benefits of the hybrid model. But that being said, there's still a lot of pain points for customers around that. And so containers are really being invested in on the vendor side to address pain points, mostly around, you know, migration off premise, that lift and shift approach, and then also in multi-cloud management. So we see IBM, uh, Google Cloud, and VMware making big moves in the space, really leading with platform approaches. Um, that's been fairly evident given the recent acquisition activity. Um, you know, IBM, for example, a year and a half later, we continue to see them go all in on Red Hat's platform. Um, this has really given them access to an architecture based on open standards, including the Linux operating system, and what we see as a really specialized knowledge in Kubernetes. Um, similarly, Google Cloud um, leads with this approach through its Anthos platform, which allows you to run Kubernetes in any environment. Um, and I think we're gonna see cloud revenue really start to materialize, um, driven by these past investments. Um, you know, as vendors help customers migrate to the cloud and, you know, this will also position them to better compete for workloads um, against some of the other market players. Um, VMware, as I mentioned, is another interesting call out um, because despite their expertise in legacy virtualization, which is sort of contradictory to their business model, they've really jumped on the container bandwagon over the last couple of years. Um, you know, as the market shifts um, in favor of cloud versus traditional software, um, this move became first really clear when VMware acquired Heptio in late 2018, and then a year later they closed their acquisition of Pivotal. And what we've seen is this really paved the way for them to meet demands for those lightweight apps and microservices and help clients um, look up the technology stack and actually create value. Um, and so it's interesting to see how VMware has been evolving over the past few years. You know, in 2019, we had several acquisitions 
And then 2020 was a year of them integrating across the stack and actually making that work. And so now they're really capitalizing on a modern apps portfolio and trying to bridge gaps between, you know, developers and operations teams. But however, as we look into 2021, I think it's worth giving a quick mention to very recent news that um, the MWare CEO is going back to Intel um, to lead Intel. So it will be interesting to see how VMware's container strategy kind of unfolds under this new leadership. And then in addition to that, some of the emphasis they've placed on these new innovations like GPU technology, for example. So um, that's something we'll track in 2021 as well. And then from the customer side, in our own research, as you can see on the slide, um, we found over half of respondents are actively adopting these solutions and also plan to adopt further. We continue, and this is because we continue to see a direct relationship between um, hybrid cloud and containers. Um, and it's really been accelerated as IT teams re-examine their cloud roadmaps and what a migration plan will look like um, due to COVID-19. And so we think containerizing some of those workloads will be uh, top of mind in that process um, when it comes to weighing, you know, cost benefits um, versus, you know, taking those legacy virtualization systems with them. So in the longer term landscape, we kind of see containers challenging VMs, um, you know, getting rid of that underlying infrastructure layer of the stack and allowing multiple resources to run on a single operating system, you know, proves faster and more efficient versus running several um, VMs alongside each other. Um, that being said, there are still some interim challenges. Um, you know, as we continue to talk to customers, security and autonomy remain top of mind concerns when moving to the cloud. And, you know, in addition to that, just a general lack of in-house resources needed for a successful implementation. Um, but in general, as multi-cloud and specifically hybrid cloud um, gain traction, and that's where we think customers are headed, containers are viewed as a really viable option, um, you know, as they enable workloads to run more freely across multiple different in infrastructures. Um, and, you know, this is really critical for customers who want to avoid vendor lock-in, and that's a really big trend we're seeing as well. Um, so in, in 2021, containers will continue to play a key role in helping clients, um, you know, develop more agnostic approaches. And so we can expect um, that the cloud leaders to lead with these kind of past-led Kubernetes-driven investments. Um, and with that, Alan, I'll pass it back to you, and maybe we can talk about the related research we have and go into questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, just as we've gone throughout the presentation today, you know, with uh, the accelerated demand, um, it's going to take different forms for different customers. And so for the, the partnership and the industry cloud and the containers, um, I think a lot of that is for uh, more advanced implementations. Those are going to be mission critical workloads that are shifting um, while there's been a lot of horizontal ERP um, adoption, and you've seen uh, SAP and Oracle um, and NetSuite, you know, illustrate that with their their growth in those spaces. Um, there's a lot of nuance in a lot of industries where uh, the core, you know, kind of standard application sets haven't been, you know, as aggressively offered in a cloud model. So partnerships and specialization by industry and um, having them be modern containerized applications are really important. So I think that's kind of a common thread as we've gone through these these predictions that uh, those are all going to be more important for the cloud adoption in 2021 and, and forward than some of the more um, front office lightweight adoption that a lot of less mature organizations have gotten started with in terms of cloud. 
So here we have um, just a list of the available research that a lot of this is, is pulled from, and um, you'll see these themes show up in the different vendor reports we mentioned. Um, some of the graphs, Katie's graph, as well as the um, the graph that I had at the beginning, um, I think Evan's, actually all the graphs, um, are pulled from the customer research that we do twice a year. Uh, the most recent version uh, just published a um, couple weeks ago, um, back in towards the end of 2020. Um, so that'll be updated on uh, kind of the late spring time frame. Um, so, so reach out if any of this is of interest and I'd like, like to go deeper on uh, the predictions or kind of the, the overall coverage of these vendors and, and spaces. And uh, always feel free to reach out. Here's our contact information. Um, so we have a couple questions that came in. Feel free to submit more as we go through. Um, and we'll get started with the first one. Um, so the first question is around um, what's the effect in terms of the overall cloud market from a, a growth and a size perspective, given the 2020 uh, effects and uh, what that means for 2021. So I can kind of start in. I know that um, we've done multiple market forecasts throughout the year that we've adjusted some of the numbers based on both uh, what we see in the, the qualitative aspects as well as the vendor side because we did see uh, kind of in that Q2, Q3 timeline um, some impact particularly on the software as a service vendors where uh, the uncertainty and the disruption did slow down some of their sales pipeline um, and kind of implementations um, and uh, contracting activity, obviously with some of the financial impacts, there's delayed projects. Um, so I think there's a slight downturn in the middle of the year. Uh, we're gonna be looking for earnings uh, through the end of the year coming up shortly, um, but you started to see a recovery. So in 2020, at least, the the slowdown in terms of spending, the impact on growth, um, yes, it was a little bit inhibited, but nothing um, on the, you know, the, the worst case scenario did not come true um, in terms of what it could have been. And we expect to see kind of a acceleration um, starting mid to late 2021 that will uh, expand the overall market for cloud, um, public cloud services, those types of things um, beyond, I think, what we had expected um, a year ago this time. Yeah, Alan, I'll just uh, go off of that a little bit. Great. Uh, go off of that, sorry. Um, in looking at kind of what COVID, the impacts it had uh, in terms of the public cloud forecast we did, it was, it was interesting really. You know, a lot of enterprises had existing licenses for many of the SaaS solutions that kind of were key to enabling the, uh, you know, the remote workforce. But the thing was that not all the employees were using them. You know, Shadow IT still runs rampant across enterprises today. Uh, and so, what we kind of what we saw was you know while there wasn't an immediate SaaS uptick related to COVID, uh, there was in fact there was a gain in uh, infrastructure as a service revenues as these workers were forced to begin to use all these cloud-based applications they had, thus creating more consumption on the the IS infra, uh, uh, side of the house. The other thing that is kind of what we took into consideration in modeling it forward is understanding how COVID almost allowed cloud vendors and the uh, actual customers, customers themselves to overcome one of the most ch leading, one of the leading barriers to adoption of any new technology and that's cultural change. You know, it's not easy to convince people to, or to convince workers to use new solutions and try to message, you know, the value of being able to do so. But when you're first forced to work from home and you need to embrace a remote uh, <laughs> lifestyle, I mean, I know, the, the employees at TBR, we've all shifted to a very cloud-centric approach to how we do our operations today, and that was necessitated by the fact that we couldn't go into the office. As you 
now what you're going to see, I think, is you're going to, you know, these enterprises, the workers are now familiar with the technologies, familiar with how to, you know, navigate them in this new web-based approach. And it's going to allow for more consumption to happen going forward and allow for some of those, you know, that organizational change element kind of, you know, is not as um, uh, impactful, so to speak, on a vendor's ability to pursue new engagements. Great. Um, let's see, Evan, I think this would be a good one for you uh, and maybe Nikki. Um, for the sales approach for industry cloud, there was a mention of IT first by some vendors and OT first by other way, others. Um, what are some of the ways to find the right balance in making those first approaches? Yeah, I'm happy to jump on this first. <laughs> I've spent more time than I care to admit trying to understand the, the relationship and lack thereof between IT and OT departments. Uh, I think some of the you know key things I you always kind of hear from uh, organizations is that the IT department typically dictates what OT gets to do, and in this you know industry cloud is a great example of how that's really not going to work anymore because IT needs to work very closely with OT to understand what exactly they're trying to do and how the data and the information coming from the OT side of the house, which is you know it's asset specific oftentimes and it's fulfilling very specific outcomes related to be it, you know, asset health, predictive analytics on, you know, if the machine's running, uh, there's an anomaly in how it's running, we should shut it down now to fix it. It's, you know, it's, it's just elements that IT is not familiar with and they don't understand. Um, that being said, IT ha has a very strong understanding of how to integrate all these, you know, complex, disparate, technology and kind of integrate it within a singular data flow to kind of enable that digital enterprise, so to speak. And they can bring these learnings to the OT department. And so I guess in short, the way to answer it is obviously IT is, you know, a great starting point um, and probably the first, uh, you know, entry point into an organization. But encouraging them, in a, you know, in a consulting-led sales engagement, we'll call it, to bring in the OT folks so that you can kind of work with them, and not, you know, work for them. You know, understand what they need, understand how it aligns with what is already in place from an IT perspective and what needs to happen to kind of enable that harmonious, you know, flow of information between the back end, the front end, and, you know, uh, kind of achieve that digital transformation story. Yeah, Evan, I think this, um, you know, from the edge point of view, really, aligns with what I started to explain. Um, I kind of explained the relationship at a, at a high level. <laughs> we have a certain amount of time. Um, the relationship between, between um, Clearblade and IBM, um, or just any any other, you know, to your point, asset tracking, particularly in more rugged environments. So um, you're not only um, implementing OT versus IT within the context of one particular organization, but how partnership models can help to bridge some of that friction of, you know, how those two parts might might work together. And, you know, that one example that I went over was a really good way to, to kind of show that and that it is, in fact, even within the context of a singular organization, um, very important to understand where are the priorities. Like an oil rig out on the field will be much, and a company that does rugged deployments is going to be much more OT focused and have to have a very um, well implemented and streamlined OT engine that kind of the IT side might have to work more closely with where as if it, that's not the case, IT may lead and that the OT piece may have to follow what IT dictates. So I, I don't think there's one clear answer. And, you know, your piece on industry certainly kind of shows the nuances and how that does, does change by industry. And, you know, Edge is a really good kind of add on to kind of make those points more clear. Got it. Um, let's see, a question around containers. Uh, and the question is around the landscape of vendors and particularly the differences between the cloud-native Kubernetes management um, providers and the uh, Red Hats and VMwares of the world. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, I guess looking at the landscape, um, you know, the biggest takeaway is, you know, VMware sticks out with its foundations and legacy virtualization, but they're really now targeting cloud-native, but doing it really as an extension of um, 
of vSphere. You know, we saw that when they launched vSphere 7, which integrates Kubernetes into that. Um, you know, I think it's it's a little different. Um, Red Hat sticks out in a way just because, you know, they've been with Kubernetes from the beginning. And, you know, they're leading with a past Kubernetes approach, kind of like Google Cloud. But then in the landscape, you know, we also have those supporting these managed Kubernetes services on, you know, AWS, Azure, and Google as well. Um, so I think that the, you know, the OpenShift, the Anthos, and, you know, VMware trying to scale its cloud foundation approach um, in the cloud native environment um, is pretty competitive. Got it. Um, let's see. So next, I think we have time for two more questions. Um, the next one is around our insights on cultural change and adoption linked to digital transformation in cloud. Uh, yeah, am I on mute? No, I'm not. Uh, yeah, so we do have um, research looking kind of at that cultural uh, organizational change and how it pertains to digital transformation. I would say the first line of research um, to look at would be we have, through our digital uh, practice, we have uh, the voice of customer reports. It's really, you know, it dissects what these customers are looking for, you know, what are the challenges, pain points, barriers, so on and so forth. Um, so I think that would be a good one to address it. There's also the management consulting benchmark through our professional services practice, which I believe has an entire section dedicated to organizational change. Uh, uh, but I'm not, I did not write that, so don't quote me on it. And then the final piece of that would be all of the customer studies, which um, the cloud team authors, which would be the platforms and infrastructure research, and then also the applications research, which you know, applications, for instance, it looks at readiness or maturity, adoption plans, you know, budget types of questions related to, you know, CRM, ERP, HCM. Uh, and then the infrastructure side focuses more on, the, you know, that, you know, what, what do you, uh, the, the, the relationship, so to speak, between traditional on-prem and the uh, hybrid cloud and then obviously cloud-based uh, storage and infrastructure. Right. Yeah, and just in kind of qualitatively through some of that research, um, you know, it's baked into what we expect to enable the acceleration and adoption that, you know, a lot of ways it wasn't the technology that was the barrier, it was the the culture within the organization, the skill set, the, the legacy um, and the staffing that held uh, a lot of projects back from being deployed via cloud and, and um, with uh, the rapid change due to COVID, uh, there was really no choice for a lot of us. And so, um, you know, they say it, six months of, of COVID is uh, enabled six years of change for a lot of organizations. And I think that's um, the cultural part is the biggest uh, aspect of that. And so that's expanded upon in a lot of that other research in different angles um, for what that means and examples and industries and uh, just more detail about that that shift that has happened and that will continue um, because it's it's never static. All right, uh, let's see, one more question. Uh, let's see, what's the last one? Um, what was that last one? Evan, was there a question that, that you wanted to hit on? Um, I don't see any there. Um, no, not not on there now. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, I found one more. The what are the industries that have the that will have the most change in 2021? Um, so I can kind of lead That's in. It. I think this relates to some of the other industry stuff we've already been talking about. Um, but in terms of the change, a, a lot of the um, the most pronounced change is taking place in industries that have been uh, most uh, resistant to cloud, slowest to adopt for um, the, the more mission critical aspects of their organization. So uh, industries like insurance, we've had multiple interviews, healthcare, uh, education, 
all those have been uh, really forced to, to go through a lot of that cultural change and implement new solutions to adjust their, their business model. So I think that'll have a big impact. Um, I also think there's a regional element where, uh, for instance, we're doing interviews in um, Canada and other regions outside the U.S. where cloud adoption hasn't been as rapid. There's differences in terms of infrastructure and levels of investment that uh, have made them slower to to shift and uh, transform. And um, again, there's been kind of a push with uh, 2020 and, you know, those those changes, just like a lot of the solutions that have been put in place, um, it's not just going to revert back to the old way of doing business. Um, we have, in some of the questions we asked, we asked folks, uh, you know, returning to the same way of doing business was an option for uh, what the outcome of all this is going to be. And consistently in the single digits, people said that no matter what happens, it's not going to be uh, a return to 2019. Um, and so that's part of, you know, what makes the cloud space interesting. Yeah, and just kind of dovetailing off that too, and I would, I would echo your point that um, the low-hanging fruit industry that needs to stay the same. You know, it's, healthcare. There's obviously a lot of needs there, uh, given given COVID. Um, you know, telemedicine is just one example. But then, how do you maintain the, your security posture as you start to enable more of these IoT-centric outcomes? Uh, I mean, I think I saw a story or a partnership between AWS and a, a medical device manufacturer. I think it was for smart watches. But, you know, in just thinking about that one use case, it, you know, you're opening your, your yourself up to a significant degree of you know, risk, so to speak. If you're going to start to allow, uh, you know, a smart watch to transmit patient data to your um, uh, your uh, your infrastructure, be it on premise or in the cloud. I mean, that's it's going to create a wide degree of uh, holes, so to speak, in your network. Outside of the you know called the low hanging fruit, I think the longer term opportunity. And I would caveat the statement by saying that I'm a little biased, but I think industrial IoT is going to be um, represent a significant opportunity going forward. And we're in the process now of planning some research to kind of look at that. And it takes a, a different lens, I would say, than traditional coverage that you'll find in like a TBR benchmark or a market landscape, where it's really telling the story in the context of the user. So for, you know, the persona using, say, an asset management solution, you know, what, who is that persona? What are their actual needs? What are their pain points? What are their titles? What are their desired outcomes? Because once you understand what those you know, elements are, you can then create, you know, the resultant use case based off that. So you map the persona to the use case, and then in order to serve that use case, you have to set in place the proper technology value chain to enable it. So, um, you know, uh, earlier I was talking about the, you know, lo business logistics network from SAP. They, they already secured partnerships with satellite manufacturers, with shipping uh, data trackers with, to, to make sure that they can actually tell that or provide that outcome to the user. I mean, if you take it now and think about, you know, a remote oil and gas pipeline in Antarctica, you're going to have those same needs around needing to transmit highly critical, you know, time-sensitive data based off, you know, is this thing leaking? Uh, is the flow proper? Is, you know, is everything working in the right way? And, you know, Microsoft, for instance, doesn't have all those nitty gritty, you know, uh, technology capabilities to enable that right now. They're going to need a partner for it. They're going to need to understand who all those entities are that can let them bring that to the customer. Um, and so that's kind of how we're trying to frame the research is really tell it in the context of what's trying to be enabled because that's, you know, the value is going to be based off the top needs, the top pain points that a client has. And then that's going to inform the opportunity and the resultant ecosystem to enable it. And it's not going to—it's going to be extremely different as you look at different industries. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And if you, you know, as I said earlier, if you de develop these technologies in the vacuum, you run the risk of just de developing technology for technology's sake. Okay. Um, well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, the slides are available for sharing. Just reach out if you would like a copy. Uh, we will try to follow up with any questions we didn't get to 
after, um, and there'll be a replay link if you want to go back and listen again or share it with other colleagues. Um, and uh, thank you for filling out the survey. Um, look for the next predictions webinar. I'm not sure which one it is, but it'll be next week. Uh, we'll be doing these kind of on a weekly basis throughout January and February in different spaces of the IT market. Um, so thanks again, and take care, everybody.